Chris, do you want me to put up JB's slides? Sorry, I was just setting up the live stream. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Chris, can you see me? Chris, can you see me? Not quite. Hold on a second. I just want to make sure I'm on the right one. You're on the right one. Yep. Okay, good. Give JB a minute to sign on. Yep. I'm going to text a link. Always tough transitioning from one to the other. Try to smooth that out. Give it another minute here. Good morning, guys. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Trying to make sure JB has the right link to sign on. Okay, looks like we've got it. Am I muted? 
Yep, you're okay. you're got you now. Okay, uh, I don't know if Jake's around, but I wanted to just thank. He's you. on. Uh, Jake, are you there? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you guys, uh, Jake, and uh, your group have been, you know, integral members. Many of you trained at Mount Sinai, um, and integral members of the department over the over the years. Uh, and the interest, the engagement, and the value continues. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you for this uh, and remind people that uh, Jake exists. He's there. He's out there. Uh, he went when Jake was a resident here. Uh, he was a you know vital force in in the department, and uh, you know that that energy continues in his own practice. Uh, you can see that he's got an unbelievable pedigree and uh, extremely engaged and engaging and academically oriented neurosurgeon. Uh, can you go to the next uh, thing? Um, over the past several years, this is the this is an experience in cadavers uh, that uh, he has sponsored at the, that their group sponsors and that he runs. Um, and I don't know if you wanted to make any any comments, Jake. Uh, I think there's a picture there's a picture that is that follows that shows what it was. But Jake, you want to just tell us what your ideas about this and and you know what you have in mind for this for the residents and why you're doing it? Uh, sure. Thank you, Dr. Batterson. Thank you very much for that. You know, our group really values our relationship uh, at Mount Sinai. We love being part of the adjunct faculty here. And um, and to that end, we always wonder how we can contribute uh, more than just, you know, operating. Um, and, and to that, I I think it was in 2017, I think that was, or 2016 was the first year that um, I started um, helping lead a lab. Um, I did get, um, I was, I've been able to arrange for a two cadaver lab just about every single year. And then one year we did two different labs. Um, the focus really has been to allow each resident at his or her level to to grow. So I think that um, an anatomy labs such as this, cadaver labs, allow the resident to explore the anatomy, something that they may not be able to do in a in a real you know in a in a live patient, to try to learn uh, in a non pressured environment, uh, surrounded by their peers and by their senior uh, residents, and it also allows. The more senior residents to hone in on both a teaching and a supervisory role, which is a different, a difficult role to learn how to do, um, and it allows them to do and gain experience with techniques that are not so common, such as you know C1 lateral mass screws, and then just you know uh, access accessing instrumentation that is just not as common, and often uh, is will be done by the attending or by the you know chief resident. Um, so I think that the lab is really has two goals is one to allow the junior residents to learn in a pressure-free environment and really learn the anatomy and look at the radiographic correlates on on the you know using the x-rays that we take and allows the more senior uh, and seasoned residents to learn how to teach the residents uh, and learn some techniques that they may not have uh, much experience to on their own yeah that's great I don't know why you would think that there's any pressure in our environment here but I, I don't mind that you are serving as a relief valve. Uh, so, so who who were the participants? Can you go back to that previous slide, Chris? So Halima, Matt, Abi, Jeff, Frank, Jeff, Ernest, Jorge, Jacques, and George. That's great. And did you guys find it useful? So the senior person there was Ernest and then uh, Jeff and, and Frank and Jeff. Um, and, and then you had also some uh, rising residents coming. I'm sure that Alima and Matt and Abby and George and Jacques and Jorge uh, found it interesting. Jeff, yeah. Gilly, what, what, did, what is the value of this sort of thing to us? Yeah, I thought this was fantastic, uh, Dr. Betterson. Everything that Jake said rang true. Uh, certainly a, a low pressure environment, a great opportunity to, you know, one, discover what you've learned that you didn't realize you learned um, over the years, and also uh, great to be in the practice 
of uh, mentoring junior residents while also uh, you know, pushing the bar in terms of uh, your own comfort with some of these techniques and having you know, someone as experienced as Jake watching over you. So, so I thought it was awesome. You know, Costas has, has been advocating for this for our intracranial work. And uh, maybe we can partner with you, Jake, uh, since you have the access to the lab and so on, to find a way to extend this into an intracranial session. Uh, we could certainly make some phone calls to figure it out. I, I will say that this is every year so far has been a different laboratory. I've been really trying to figure out different things. So this was a mobile laboratory, which worked out really nicely. Uh, I think part of the reason was that this year had COVID and there's a lot of laboratories that were closed down, uh, but we can certainly look into it. Okay, well, you know, profound thanks to you and the group for doing this. It's a really great thing. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. What's up next, Chris? Peter's actually, oh, do you have the slideshow? Um, next up is Dr. Margettis. Let me uh, share that. Um, good morning. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, good morning. Uh, so today we're going to uh, discuss about endoscopic spine surgery. It's a big topic. Uh, the goal of this presentation is more like a synopsis and an introduction to the technique. And uh, we'll focus on uh, showing some uh, videos. Um, so about endoscopic spine surgery, the, the term endoscopic has been used for many types of spine surgeries. The one that we're gonna to focus today is uh, the endoscopic spine surgery that we do through a single incision and through constant irrigation of fluid. So this is usually referred as full endoscopic in the literature. Uh, again, single incision and constant irrigation. So we're working uh, in a fluid um, medium, the same way that uh, Dr. Morgan and Dr. Gatan do the intraverticular uh, endoscopy the same way that Dr. Kellner does the um, hematoma evacuation inside the brain under constant irrigation. So let's see a case here just to, so this is a uh, right side uh, uh, extruded disc herniation. So this is uh, a view of uh, the ligamentum flavum. And uh, we start uh, resecting the ligamentum flavum to create a hole, a small hole and get access to the spinal canal. And you see here epidural fat. So we have gained access into the spinal canal. So we insert, uh, the endoscope, and uh, we start dissecting uh, in the epidural space, uh, epidural fat. And uh, you see that here is the first piece of extruded disc material that uh, we're going to retrieve. And uh, here's a, a second bigger piece of um, extruded disc that um, we're able to take out. And uh, this, uh, you can see a limitation of the technique where even like a minor bleeding can obscure your field of view. There are ways to, you know, uh, uh, treat that, you know, by precise application of uh, uh, the, the cautery. And uh, over here, you can see the nerve root that is uh, decompressed. We look under it, there is no uh, missed uh, disc fragment, and then we come out. So that was a just a short video about the technique. And uh, before we uh, go in, into more detail about the techniques, let's go over the equipment. There are various endoscopes. They all share the same pattern. They have uh, a lumen for the uh, insertion of instruments. They have a lumen for the uh, inflow of the irrigation and the outflow is through this bigger lumen. And there is another uh, area where we have the camera and the illumination. And uh, there, uh, we first, we use the dilator to dock uh, the endoscope. It's the same principle as uh, the matrix dilator. And then over this piece, we insert the cannula. And then we remove the dilator, and then we insert the uh, endoscope. So this is the complete system with the cannula, the endoscope, and actually uh, a micro is going through the working uh, channel. Uh, we also use bipolar cautery. We also have drills that we can use through the endoscope. Here's the, the machine for the constant irrigation. And uh, we need uh, these arthroscopic towers in order to uh, visualize, um, in order to be able to see on the screen uh, where, where we're working. Now, uh, AO spine, uh, I, I mean, the approach is to the lumbar spine. There are uh, 
divided to inter the interlaminar approach and transforaminal approach. And AO spine has classified the interlaminar approach uh, in, in uh, there are four ways that you can do the interlaminar approach. Just a quick reminder, when we're dealing with lumbar stenosis, uh, it's easy to consider that there are four zones, the central zone, lateral recess, foraminal and far lateral zone. So one way to use the endoscopic technique is to go in and do a lateral recess decompression. Another way is to go in and uh, do a discectomy, either in the central or lateral recess uh, zone. Another way is to go in and uh, after you complete the ipsilateral decompression, then tilt the scope and uh, look across over the top and do a contralateral decompression. Basically do a bilateral decompression through a single opening and through access only from uh, one side. And then you can also use this very oblique trajectory and uh, go into the contralateral foramen and that allows you to do a very thorough foraminotomy and at the same time preserve uh, most of the facet joint. <clears throat> and uh, in a different, if you try to do that from the other side, you'll have to take uh, most of the facet joint to basically destabilize the spine. So this approach allows you to do a thorough decompression without uh, destabilizing the spine. In terms of where we dock the endoscope, uh, use, when we're doing a discectomy, we usually dock it directly on the ligamentum flavum as we saw in the initial uh, video. And that's the size of uh, the endoscope. So you can see that you can easily fit it into the uh, ligamentum flavum, into the interlaminar space. When we're doing lateral recess decompression, our docking point is over here, which is the medial and inferior corner of the inferior articulate process. This is where we dock and we start doing the bony work when we're doing uh, lateral recess or any kind of bony work. Now, in order to understand a little bit better the endoscopic uh, discectomy, it's important to understand this principle where we go in with a, with a cannula and the endoscope and uh, the deep uh, end of the beveled end of the cannula is lateral, is looking lateral. So we, we advance that all the way to the disc herniation, all the way to the, to the annulus. And once we're all the way um, anteriorly, then we rotate that. And that way, the, uh, the deep end of the cannula retracts the, the nerve roots, and we can also tilt the endoscope if we need an um, additional degree of uh, retraction. So let's see that uh, in action. Let's see that principle in action. Over here, we have the nerve root, and we're working lateral to it. And uh, we're advancing the deep end of the cannula lateral to the nerve. And uh, you'll see. OK, so once we're happy, you'll see that uh, we start, um, we're going to start rotating. So you see we rotate it and um, the nerve root was uh, retracted immediately. The nerve root is there. We rotate the cannula and uh, we get access to the herniated disc material. We're doing the discectomy and at the end of uh, our discectomy we take uh, another look at um, the nerve root to make sure it's well decompressed. You can see the nerve root there. Now let's see um, another example of um, either laminar discectomy, a little bit more challenging. This was a calcified, small but calcified disc herniation. So we're, do, uh, we're docking the scope. You see that we use a different trajectory because we try to go under the lamina. We don't want to do any kind of uh, bony work to get access to the spinal canal. So over here, we're uh, resecting the ligamentum flavum to get access into the spinal canal. And after gaining access, we are inserting the cannula. You see here the epidural fat. And just to orient ourselves, medial is up, cranial is to the left here, the neural elements, and we have the deep end of uh, the cannula lateral. We resect the epidural fat to see the uh, neural elements a little bit better. So small bleeding there from the nerve that we'll try to uh, control with a very precise application of uh, cautery, and we did that. And uh, we are now uh, dissecting the lateral epidural space. And uh, over here, we have uh, recognized the uh, disherniation. We're rotating the deep end of the cannula to retract uh, the nerve medially. And uh, in the endoscopic cases, I mean, we, of course, we 
uh, work based on the visualization, but we also rely very much in the palpation of the structures. So over here, we're trying to define with the coder a little bit better the calcified disc herniation. There are some element, some areas that uh, looks a little bit uh, soft. So we'll try to resect uh, the soft part of uh, the disc herniation. And uh, here is the, the disc space and here is the calcified, uh, the, the osteophyte. So we're not happy with how this uh, osteophyte um, was still protruding into the spinal canal. And uh, there was no way to resect that with the uh, So we're gonna insert the, uh, the high speed drill. And when the drill is effective and it's cutting on bone, you see this kind of snowstorm, which is basically the tiny particles of bone that uh, they're floating into the uh, liquid medium. So after we're happy with uh, the bony resection, we take uh, a look again on the nerve root. You see that now it's no longer compressed and uh, it uh, comes back into place um, without any, any compression or any kind of um... And we're gonna take a look under the nerve root to make sure that we haven't missed any uh, extruded piece. Okay, now uh, we're gonna take a look at uh, a different um, type of um, application, which is uh, lateral recess decompression. So this patient had, um, as you can see here, foraminal and uh, lateral recess stenosis, foraminal on one side, lateral recess stenosis on the other side. So now we have docked the scope over the um, medial inferior end of the inferior articulate process. And uh, we are following the interface between the ligamentum flavum, which is on the left, and uh, the facet joint, which is on the right. So ligamentum flavum, here is the facet joint that um, we, we have uh, entered it. Here is a superior articulate process, inferior articulate process. And we don't want to drill too much inside the facet joint. We want to stay medial and want to, and that's why you're following this interface between the ligamentum flavum and the bone. So here's the tip of the superior articulate process. Again, superior articulate process, facet joint, inferior articulate process, ligamentum flavum. So we, we're palpating because sometimes you cannot really tell whether it is uh, ligamentum flavum or bone. So we're palpating there to see. And um, it was a very thin um, layer of bone that uh, we're able to break it off with a pencil four. And uh, it's very, very important to make sure that you, ha you have decompressed all the way to the tip of the spear articulate process, because as we know the foraminal stenosis and, um, is basically caused by the spear articulate process. So if you don't go all the way to the tip of the spear articulate process, then probably you, you you're gonna leave some uh, residual stenosis. So again, here we're dissecting and breaking some uh, small areas of bone. And here we are inserting the keratin rodeur to complete the resection of the tip of the spear articulate process. So we have uh, reached all the way to, uh, to the foramen and here's the tip of the spear articulate process that you need to make sure that you have gone over it when you're doing the decompression. And uh, now here we are um, biting off the ligamentum flavum to thin it down. Uh, many people say that it's not really necessary to resect the whole ligamentum flavum. If you thin it enough and you have done um, adequate decompression, then th that's all that the nerve needs. So we're done uh, from on, on this side and we're gonna go on the other side. So this is how it initially looks when you dock the scope. You see a little bit of soft tissue, you see a little bit of uh, muscle that uh, we clean up with a coater and uh, uh, the, the, the rodeur and uh, over here, uh, you can see the ligamentum flavor on the right and uh, the inferior articulate process on the left. Again, this is the initial point where we start our boning work, the medial inferior corner of the IAP. And uh, on this side, we're gonna use this articulating bear that as you can see, it can articulate and that allows you to drill uh, around corners and uh, you can go like up to seven millimeters around corners. And uh, that's very, very important when you're doing this ipsilateral decompression where you can preserve most of the dorsal uh, bone and most of the dorsal part of the fasten joint and still be able to do adequate um, foraminal decompression. On this side, we decide to resect um, the ligamentum flame. You see here how we take the bites with uh, the carousel rodeur and here's the spinal canal. Okay, so before, uh, the next thing we're gonna discuss is the transforaminal approach, but before we go to the transforaminal approach, it's very important to 
become familiar with the Cambrian's triangle. That was the initial description of the Cambrian's triangle. It's not the best um, actually uh, image to, to describe it. Uh, this image is a little bit better. And uh, the best way to see the Cambrian's triangle is through this oblique view. And uh, it is defined by the extinct nerve root, the superior end plate of the lower vertebra. And medially, uh, although we call that triangle, but actually there are two structures that were uh, described as the medial border. One is uh, the superior articulate process, which is basically the roof of the foramen. And a little bit deeper is the traversic nerve root. So this is the area that um, uh, we were doing these transforaminal uh, operations with the endoscope. And uh, in healthy uh, patients, in, in healthy people, uh, this space is, uh, is, is pretty wide. I mean, you can see here the lateral border of the, of the cambrian triangle at the lateral aspect of the pedicles. Uh, it can be as high as one centimeter, as you can see here. Again, on this view, cranial is to the, re to the right, uh, feet is to the left. And again, this, the, all these areas, the cambrian triangle, and um, you can see that it's wide, as wide as one centimeter at the lateral aspect of the, of the pedicle. But um, in clinical cases where you have facet hypertrophy, that, that is not so well defined. So in this uh, view here, uh, cranial is to the left, the feet is to the right. Here you see a hypertrophic facet joint, and here's the extic nerve root. And this is the Cabin's triangle, which is not really a triangle, it's more like a slit-like space. And uh, in this study, they actually saw that up to 80% of the patients, they actually they don't have a, a real triangle there. So that makes a little bit challenging the transforaminal approach because that's where you need to dock the endoscope and start working. And that's, that's a limitation. There are some ways to um, you know, circumvent that that we're gonna discuss. Um, you need, uh, if you do this case, you need to be familiar with the anatomy of the vertebral foramen. There are some important ligaments there. We don't always see them, but what we uh, do see very frequently are the veins in the area. So the veins are usually located either under or over the pedicle. And uh, we also very frequently see the dorsal ramus of uh, the nerve root. You know, most of the times when we are referring to the extinct nerve root, we only think about the ventral ramus that will go ahead and form the, uh, the labosacral plexus. But there's also this dorsal ramus, which is very important uh, for, um, from a pain perspective. This is um, the area where the pain doctors, they, they do the, the injections for facet blocks. And that's, that's the area that they do the radiofrequency ablation. Uh, so, uh, what can you do with a transforaminal approach? So when you go in, you use this uh, oblique trajectory. Usually the skin incision is up to 10 or 12 centimeters from the midline. And uh, you go in and you can uh, go after um, um, a foraminal disc herniation. You can unroof um, the foramen here and do a foraminotum. You can go further in and uh, decompress actually the lateral recess, or you can go in the far lateral zone and do a resection of a far lateral um, disc herniation. In terms of where you dock the scope, uh, the initial description is to dock it exactly in the Cambridge triangle, which is this blue dot. Uh, the red line is the extinct nerve root. But uh, as we saw, sometimes when there is a facet hypertrophy, there is no, th this space is very, very, very small. So uh, some people they have uh, described that uh, the initial docking should be the superior articulate process over here. My preference is to dock it actually at the junction of the transverse process and superior articulate process, uh, very close to the area that. Um, we will use as um, the entry point for the percutaneous pedicle screws. So let's see here, case of uh, transforaminal decompression. So you see that patient had a foraminal and far lateral disc herniation. We dock the scope. And uh, we start uh, our dissection. So you'll see that there's a structure that will start coming into view, this structure here. Um, up is medially, um, the head is to the left. And you can see that there is a structure that starts coming to view and actually bifurcates. So that, that's actually the dorsal ramus of the nerve. And in every single fusion case where we prepare the entry points, we take that nerve for, for pedicle screws. So again, dorsal ramus, uh, L4 pedicle here. The disc herniation is there, and here's where we expect the exiting nerve root. And you see that we have the deep end of the cannula towards the exiting nerve root to protect the nerve root from our manipulations. And over here, we have started doing the discectomy. Uh, we alternate between uh, the cautery and um, the rangiers. The cautery helps shrink, uh, shrink the disc and control any kind of uh, minor oozing that uh, will obscure our field of view.
And once we have the bulk, uh, the discrimination is going to rotate, and uh, the extinct nerve root comes into, uh, into view. This is the extinct nerve root. Some bleeding there that, um, okay. So we'll continue with uh, uh, the discectomy. We're not happy with uh, the decompression of the nerve, so we're going to continue resecting this material. And uh, here we're still at the annulus uh, depth, but as we go deeper, you'll see that uh, uh, the, this material can, becomes a little bit more whitish. So this is the nucleus pulposus. And you see we've gone uh, in adequate depth. And uh, here's the the corner of uh, the inferior. Dr. Margaret, it's just to give you a five minute warning. Okay. So here we're actually uh, resecting that um, um, end plate to get some uh, decompression of uh, the ventral aspect of um, of the foramen. Okay. And here's a nerve root, uh, well decompressed. We're happy with it. Now, uh, th there are many publications with uh, RCTs that uh, show the advantages of endoscopic technique, basically less, um, uh, fewer complications uh, and um, less invasiveness of the overall technique. So uh, there was a publication that uh, compared the endoscopic technique with a traditional surgery. For discectomy, you see that uh, it uh, compares very favorably. There's only like a slightly increased herniation rate, but the overall reoperation rate is definitely lower for endoscopic techniques. For endoscopic uh, uh, stenosis decompression, uh, the, the advantages are even uh, bigger. So here they, they saw that uh, for discectomy, probably the advantage of endoscopic techniques over traditional techniques are minimal, but for more complex operations, the advantage is more substantial. And then for the very complex operations, it's better to go open. Uh, so we can also do endoscopic uh, fusion with that technique. Uh, some instruments that they are very important for this technique is this expandable disc saver, uh, this articulating curette, um, the articulating bear, and the small expandable cages. So let's see this case really quick. Uh, this patient had an unstable spondylolisthesis. So after the initial uh, percutaneous disc preparation, we insert the endoscope in the disc space and uh, we are shrinking um, the, uh, the disc uh, with uh, bipolar and we're using pituitary injuries to resect tender residual disc. And then in order to prepare really well the end plates, we're gonna use uh, the articulating pair to drill off the cartilage and expose uh, bleeding bone. Uh, bleeding bone means that we have fully resected the, the cartilage and we have adequately decompressed uh, the end plates for, for the fusion. You can see here the I'll move a little bit faster. So here is the uh, one of the end plates well prepared. And uh, the other thing that we do here, you see bleeding bone, that's that's a good preparation. And over here now we have docked the endoscope over the fasten joint, and we're using the cautery to clean the soft tissue over the fasten joint, all the synovial um, um, tissue is being um, coagulated. And then we're gonna use uh, the bear to drill inside the fasten joint to decorticate and promote fusion through the uh, fasten joint as well. So uh, there, there's only comparison study between MIS, still leaf and endoscopic techniques. And uh, it shows that there are some advantages, but um, the indication are still limited. And uh, there's definitely a learning curve for the endoscopic fusion. But the potential is really huge. I mean, here's the Miami group where they published uh, of uh, uh, they published 100 cases that they did um, endoscopic fusion without general anesthesia. Their case series now is close to 300 patients. So you see the potential is huge. I mean, being able to do a fusion without general anesthesia is really, really huge. And we can also use the endoscopic technique to do uh, cervical operations. You can do a posterior cervical foraminotomy discectomy, which is a very reasonable uh, option. You can use it to go through the disc from the front and do a an, an discectomy from the front but uh, not commit to a fusion, which is a question of whether it's really advantageous over traditional techniques. And then there are some people who are really pushing the envelope and they treated this big uh, central disc herniation through a kind of modifying transpedicular approach to go uh, ventral to the spinal cord, which I find to be very, very risky. So that's, that's it. Con, it's Jeremy. Yeah. I just Hey, that was a great talk, and I think endoscopic surgery is very challenging. And I, I uh, applaud your that you you not just you don't just talk the talk, walk the walk, and you do these very complicated cases. I think 
uh, Khan arranged a lab for the residents and we did a, uh, and we practiced these techniques and it just showed that, e you know, even if you've done it before, it's very challenging. And I think the next step, and I think Khan would probably agree is that if we can very easily pair endoscopic with navigation to help you get the perfect trajectory and, and confirm where you are, I think that's a really nice next step that we can, that we can work toward. But I think uh, really amazing how you've done all these cases endoscopic. Okay, really nice work. That I, I, you know, it's always nice to see someone kind of challenging the existing paradigm and trying to push things along. And you know, things aren't easy. You have to adjust and and you know, really make sure um, you're oriented correctly and, and your outcomes are the, are similar. So my question to you is, what's the diameter of the working channel endoscope you're using? Of the working channel is approximately five millimeters. The, the endoscope, uh, the diameter of the endoscope is seven millimeters. So the working channel is uh, around five millimeters, five point something millimeters. As we, as we were watching your presentation, it, it just came to, you know, I was just thinking out loud that this is an opportunity to design some new instruments, you know, as you, de as you develop some of these approaches further, because you were grabbing the ligament with the pituitary rondure I wonder if there's an instrument opportunity you could develop here that can help with that. So there's, you know, a better opportunity to clean things and visualize things better. Yeah, great point. Yeah, uh, I, I think there's uh, definitely uh, opportunity for more, um, for, for better instruments. For example, the technology of the endoscopes that we use is still like 40 or 50 years old. You know, we still use this, uh, uh, you know, the, the endoscope that, you um, it has this lens, the integrated lens, but um, I, I think the next step is to use digital cameras. So that will allow for even smaller endoscopes uh, and uh, the same size of working channel. Nice. Hey, Dr. Merges, it's Alex. If I have a chance to ask a quick question. Thank you so much for the sure. talk. This is a really interesting technology that I hope we can implement further here at Sinai. So I had a question about monitoring complications. I saw in the one review paper, you talk about you know comparable durotomy rates, but but just from your experience in terms of actually managing these complications, you know, you're working through such a small channel with a minimal um, decompression. How do you feel like how often can you you know repair a durotomy, for example, through so, maintaining endoscopic means versus having to convert to either a microscopic or or even an open uh, approach? Uh, great question. So uh, actually, I had one dura tear that uh, I was able to plug it in, uh, take a small piece of gel foam, I was able to plug it in. And because you're working through such a very small, you know, skin incision, um, actually, it's very, very forgiving. And uh, there is anecdotal, um, you know, I've spoken with other people who do that, who had more dura tears. I only had like one case that the patient actually did fine, woke up as though nothing happened. Uh, and they, they claim the same thing that uh, because you're working through this very narrow channel, um, there, there is, uh, it, it's much more forgiving. And most of these dural tears are actually very, very, very small. They're, uh, you know, comparable to the dural tear that you'll get by placing a, a two-hue needle and place a lumbar drain. That's, well, that's the size of most of the, of the dural tears that you can get through the endoscopic te techniques. Because you're working very close to the dura under high magnification. So it's, uh, it's a little bit difficult to get like a big uh, dural tear. Most of these tears are very, very small. Great, thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, let's move on to our next speaker, Paul Singh. Um, Dr. Mako is going to say a few words first. Can you hear me okay? Chris? Yes, we can. Yep. Great. Uh, it's, it's bittersweet to get to introduce Paul right now. Um, I think as many of you know, uh, Paul uh, has started a new family and uh, has decided to relocate closer to where he grew up and his parents and uh, will be leaving us or is leaving us currently. Um, and so while it's, it's great to introduce him and uh, let him sort of share his experience, uh, it's, it's sad to realize that it's come in the context of, of his departure, although we know it's something that he's not doing lately and that it's something that he, uh, he's really excited about and it's gonna be great for he and his family. Um, Paul's been a fantastic part of our team, uh, an instrumental partner to all of us over this time. Uh, and, and I think if I was going to say one thing that stood out is he's universally adored for his education. Uh, I got so much feedback from 
um, not just uh, residents or medical students, but but nurses and and APPs uh, and other faculty about how clearly passionate Paul is about education. So he really brought brought that dynamic to our team, and we're going to miss it. Paul, thank you for everything you've done, and uh, good luck on your talk and on this next phase. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jada. Thank you for the kind words. It's really a bittersweet um, experience here leaving Sinai. I, uh, I will say I don't take it lightly. And it really, really was a tough, tough decision because it really is a family at Mount Sinai. Um, and I'll get a little bit into that in the talk that we have today. It's going to be a hodgepodge of material. Um, can you guys see my screen here? Yes, we can. Perfect. Wonderful. So we're gonna go through a whole bunch of different things today. One of the things I wanted to go through were my favorite cases, but it's gonna go beyond that. And I figured um, I'd start with thanking a lot of the team members here. You know, everybody has been so gracious uh, with my departure. And um, I really, really appreciate everything everybody has done over the past couple of weeks um, in showing their appreciation. Um, you know, when I was doing this talk, uh, I was wondering where I should start. And I said, well, why don't I start at the beginning? And when I first walked into the atrium at Mount Sinai, I saw this picture here um, in the atrium. And I said, wow, Shriva Vascular J and the entire department has a really, really strong hold here. And I need to have equivalent goals for myself for how to grow this program. And so from the beginning, I thought I need to really build a CV practice in New York City from the ground up, which is no small task. Um, I want to continue the educational mindset of what I had at previous institutions for training our house staff, our fellows, our residents, our APPs, um, and then use the experience I had in forming a CSC and a PSC out in New Jersey to aid in the recertification here at Sinai and preparing for certification at West. And over the last few years, I've given uh, lots of lectures to help build that practice, and we successfully finished about 550 cases or so. We trained residents across all disciplines, including neurology and neurosurgery. And uh, most uh, excitingly, we survived COVID or early, early parts of COVID in New York City. Um, this right here is a picture that we have in front of our clinic and it's our endovascular team, but I call them a family and it really is uh, a true family here that you see. You know, even outside of the hospital, we actually like each other. We actually hang out. Um, and it's really, really great to see how we came together to build the CV practice over the last few years. Um, but let's jump right into my favorite cases. So this first case here, uh, Pete, you might actually recognize uh, from our time at Cornell, it's not a Sinai case, but it is a giant right ICA aneurysm. And this is my old Cornell family. And if you can see my mouse, this is Jared Notman. This was one of the first pipeline cases at Cornell uh, in 2012, and I had the pleasure of doing this as a fellow with Jared. Um, and what you can see here is we took 10 telescoping pipeline devices, that's 10, we don't put that many in usually in, in procedures now, um, but we telescoped them across the neck of the aneurysm from the MCA into the ICA with immediate stagnation of this uh, aneurysm. But it was not an easy task. I'll say that we probably destroyed at least five pipelines during that first case. They were funneling, they were breaking, and we had to slowly get them out of the body until we got this result. Fortunately for this patient, in four months, the aneurysm was gone and it was fully occluded. And we were learning a lot this time of pipeline. And I show this case in here for reference because if we move now to my experience at Sinai, here's a case that we treated in a 38 year old. And you're wondering where the aneurysm is. It's this small blister aneurysm that you see my mouse around right now. And why do I bring up this case here in this young patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage? Well, we said before that I really, really take teaching to heart. And I really feel that our fellows really need to get their hands wet and do these procedures uh, in their training. And this case was Dr. Shawera's first pipeline deployment. I leaned over to him on the right and I asked him if he had ever deployed an actual pipeline. He said, no, um, with a little bit of fear in his eyes that you see in that left picture. And he was able to do this successfully. So these are two telescoping pipeline stents that you see on the unsubtracted images on the right uh, for this blister aneurysm that you see the mouse over right now. So really nice job for 
for Hazem on this case. Um, you can see the blister there. In stark contrast, giant aneurysms aren't always treated with flow diverters. This is a 65-year-old female with a high-grade subarachnoid hemorrhage that many of you, including Frank especially, probably remember that required two EVDs overnight with ICPs that were greater than 50. And we had to rush to the angio suite to treat this as fast as possible. And we got a really nice result here. It was a giant coil pack and we got a really good result. But if you look a little more closely, it wasn't as easy as it looks. This right here on the left side is a balloon microcatheter across the neck of the aneurysm. We were doing really, really well with this case until we noticed some extravasation after it had been stable for a few minutes, requiring us to go up, recoil aggressively, and then place this stent across the aneurysm. But with all that being said, it turned out really well. Everything was open. And at one year, this patient who had high ICPs is now communicating and talking and sitting in a wheelchair, able to move all four extremities. So we can still treat these even without flow diverters uh, in other fashions. This case here I put up here uh, for just a couple fun reasons. So she came in, a young patient, with multiple aneurysms. The one in red here is the one that ruptured, and you can see how the MCA is displaced upwards. Um, but she had multiple other aneurysms. And over the last few years, we've treated all these aneurysms. And I put this on here to show you kind of the history of some of our devices that we have on here. Over here on the left, you see typical coils. Here you have a very new generation flow diverter. And here you have that flex flow diverter that has them the type that Hazem put in, in that first case that I showed you from Sinai. And on the lateral side, you see a little more. You see not only those flow diverters, but you see that these coils are different. You see that there's a one millimeter coil we use to treat the small MCA superiorly projecting aneurysm and the three millimeter coil that's a little older from here to treat that larger one that had ruptured. Another case here showing the technology in endovascular of a fun case that we did was this 54 year old female family history of, an, of ruptured aneurysms with this incidentally found basilar tip aneurysm and headaches. We were able to use this endovascular device called the web device. And I'm gonna show you what it looks like here. It's inside the lumen of the basilar and you can see it being deployed here in this video. And this procedure took less than 15 minutes to treat this aneurysm. And there's the device here on the left, you can see on the unsubtracted image. This is the same day we did a projection. You can see how contrast is stagnating in the dome of the aneurysm, showing that it's already starting to clot off. And at six months, the aneurysm is gone completely with persistent flow through the PCAs. So these new technologies really, really changed the game for treating a lot of these aneurysms. No talk would be complete in endovascular in favorite cases without showing a stroke case. This is an M2 occlusion here. We do a lot of these, you can see the clot here, but why is this case so relevant and pertinent? Well, this case was a patient that actually was in the hospital walking around, not a patient, sorry, an employee walking around in the hospital. And she was found here and immediately taking a CAT scan for a workup. We got Tiki-3 in 12 minutes. And because the door to recanalization time was so short, this was her MRI diffusion showing essentially no stroke on follow-up. and she had zero deficits uh, at discharge from the hospital. So what we can do in technology for stroke has really come a long ways over the last 10 years as well. Here's a case of a symptomatic left ICA stenosis in a patient that had a left MCA territory stroke. And if you see, there's a balloon guide catheter here in the neck for a proximal flow arrest. And you can see how tight this stenosis is here. It's greater than 95% in this patient. And I show this one here uh, again to stress how important it is to teach our residents and fellows how to do these procedures while they're here. This right here is Dr. Majidi, and this is our setup here at West where we can actually see both A and B planes, the hands of the practitioner here, and um, us viewing the view screens here. I'm just gonna play a quick one minute clip. You can see here on the lower left, Dr. Majidi is slowly deploying the stent in the cervical ICA on the AP and the lateral projections. And you can see his hands moving right here. He's slowly retracting with his left hand and deploying the stent.
and good. He's got a great deployment on that. And the follow-up pictures show that we went from that greater than 95% stenosis to essentially no flow limiting stenosis here. And on the right, you can see the unsubtracted images showing the actual stent that he deployed. So we're not all work here. We're definitely some fun. And this is a couple of pictures of the last two spring softball tournaments uh, in Central Park. We've gotten better every single year. Um, it was sad that we couldn't do it again uh, this year because of COVID. And I hope you guys invite me back if you guys need somebody to play on your team uh, next year. Um, for the spine guys, including uh, Dr. Bargettis, you know, we don't just do cranial cases. This is a, a case of, um, of a spinal epidural fistula that we treated a few years back. 60-year-old um, female had progressive weakness of the lower extremities, a typical story. And on the left, you see a L3 static image of an angiogram where you can see that there's an early filling of this vein um, and there's venous congestion in the spine. Here's an unsubtracted picture of that so you can see at the level of L3. And here's an oblique view where you can actually see a venous pouch here that this uh, fistula is emptying out into. It's always nice to see the angiogram. So I'm gonna go ahead and play that here on the left. And you can see it in L3, you can see the arterial phase, but how quickly you see the venous phase in here. And there's that pouch that we see. So what we did was we navigated a microcatheter here in this middle column into what we suspected was an arterial pedicle, did a microcatheter angiogram here from the catheter here, and we find we were very close to the point of fistulization. And the hallmark of these is that you really have to occlude the point of fistulization because otherwise you'll recruit new feeders um, and you'll have a persistent fistula. So that's exactly what we did. And you can see the cast of onyx here, the embolic material in the middle column here. And this is after the embolization, you see that there's no filling of that venous pouch or the vein. And we wanna make sure that we haven't done any damage since there's a lot of longitudinal and transverse anastomoses in the spine between these vessels. We made sure that at left L1, there was a persistent filling of the artery of Ademkowitz or the ASA at this level, and it's working just fine. She woke up fine. And over the next few weeks, she had a slow improvement in her weakness, which we see in about 30% of cases. We're gonna jump ahead to another type of fistula, but this one is a fistula that's in the head. And this is a gentleman that was admitted um, with a Cognard type four dural AV fistula that many of you probably were involved with as well. Uh, he had several, several arterial embolizations before this, but he had persistent filling here in these static shots from the ECA that you see here on the right. Now I'm gonna again play through these so you can see them. And on the AP projection here from the ECA, you can see how rapidly from not only the MMA, but other feeders you have into these venous segments here in the transverse sinus and the torcula. And on the lateral, you see something very similar here. Again, branches from majority from the MMA, but also from the other side, the occipital. So we were able to take a microcatheter out here, but this is a special microcatheter that has a balloon on the end. It's called a scepter and it has two lumens and we can inject through this with a balloon inflated. And we did exactly that. We injected that same onyx cast you saw on the spine case all the way through the arterial vasculature into the spot where it anastomosed with the vein and it refluxed into other arterial feeders. And you can see after the embolization on these static images, there's no residual filling of this fistula. And on the actual angiogram, you notice the same thing on the AP, there's no longer filling of the fistula and on the lateral, an equivalent finding where you see normal filling of the ECA branches, but no early filling of the veins. I'm gonna jump ahead to another fistula, but as you guys know, I love venous approaches and traditionally CC fistulas are treated by the venous approach for that same reason we mentioned earlier and that if you just nip off little arterial feeders, you're not really treating the actual fistulization point. This was a 27 year old female who actually had a difficult labor and delivery. And with a lot of, lot of straining, afterwards she had a worsening chemosis of the right eye and double vision. She was found to have a 600 palsy on the right eye with elevated increased ocular pressure from an outpatient ophthalmologist. And this is what we saw here on the right ECA above and the right ICA below. And you can see how quickly the superior ophthalmic vein fills on here with the cavernous sinus. So traditionally, what you do is you take a transvenous approach and you come through the inferior petrosal sinus, you access the cavernous sinus here, and you coil off the point of fistulization. But she had a very interesting anatomy 
and she had a very nice external jugular vein with a facial vein that was connecting to the superior ophthalmic into the cavernous sinus. And we said, why don't we take this approach? It ended up being a lot faster to treat it this way. If you have treated these, you know that these cases can take several hours. And once we did this, this was on the order of under two hours to treat it this way, where we took a microcatheter into the pouch itself. This is the AP, this is the lateral plane. And you see that we coiled off the pouch that we suspected was the cause of fistulization for this patient. And here's her three month DSA. In fact, in two weeks, her chemosis, her double vision resolved, and her outpatient ophthalmologist said that her intraocular pressures had also resolved, and she's good to this day. Um, since we're on the run of transvenous embolizations, here's a case where we thought it was going to be something similar. This patient had similar symptoms to the previous one with headache, right eye chemosis, and proptosis, and IOPs that were elevated. And you can see how there's early opacification of the superior ophthalmic vein here, here, and here you see the cavernous sinus filling. And even on the vertebral artery run, you see the superior ophthalmic vein and cavernous sinus is filling early. So we went in with the intention of saving the eye and we coiled back just like we traditionally would in the superior ophthalmic vein into the cavernous sinus. But lo and behold, on a follow-up angiogram, we still see that there's an odd fistulization here. And if you look closely, there's a pouch that's sitting right here adjacent to the IPS and jugular vein. So we went after that pouch and honestly, it took quite a while to try to get in here. A couple hours, Travis, you were part of this case. Um, we were just about to stop. And we said, we protected the eye, let's come back to this. And just before we were about to stop, our microcatheter fell into this pouch. We successfully coiled it off. Here's the AP in the lateral. And her symptoms essentially went away two days afterwards, but at two weeks, everything had resolved completely. And this is her angiogram at three months where she has no residual fistula, uh, either from the vertebral artery run or the other projections that I show you here. Um, this is a case I've shown before, so I'm gonna rush through, but it is amongst my favorite cases, 34 year old with pulsatile tinnitus and focal stenosis here in the transverse sigmoid sinus. You see it here on the angiogram on the AP and the lateral. The IVUS was performed, and I'm going to go through quickly on here to show you how much it narrows down along the area of the stenosis. This was successfully stented here on the AP and lateral, and you can see the outflow here, how much better it is. And when he woke from anesthesia, this whooshing he had had that was debilitating was completely gone. My last case of Sinai was last week, and it was a it was a hard case, but it kind of brings things full circle. So I started with flow diversion in 2012 with one of the first devices we had in the city. And the case that I'm showing you here is a one of the newest flow diverters that was recently released in 2020 called the Surpass Evolve device. Here's a patient that previously had had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, had recanalization of a right pecan aneurysm. We placed the stent across it. And you can see that after placement of the stent, you already have stagnation in the neck of the aneurysm. So I expect this one to be gone in six months um, when she does her follow-up angiogram with you guys. We don't just do cases. This was some research that we published, uh, specifically looking at different catheters and pumps that we use for aspiration. And we uh, had a few platform presentations as well as, as, well as abstract posters and publications um, at one of our meetings. But no talk is complete without touching a little bit on COVID in 2020. And we had a lot of camaraderie that I felt this year during COVID that really brought our department together. This is uh, a lot of neurology and neurosurgery residents and attendings that came together to staff this ICU. We had food carts to bring everybody together and show that we're all unified in this. We put a lot of time and effort into PPE to make sure that our department had adequate safety. And you can see here the degree of shipments that we had um, I also had these uh, dispensers for sanitation put up uh, for our residents when they were staying in this area, as well as downstairs. And nothing really happens unless it's on social media. So we also had many of these donations and these uh, volunteers that donated placed on social media to show our appreciation for the efforts they put in helping our department uh, protect us from COVID. And it truly is a work family that I've been part of. And I just wanna show a couple of slides here. So even during COVID, 
we managed to all get together and have happy hours with the entire team. You can see even Dr. Berenstein made an appearance here uh, for these. Um, we really, really kind of miss each other. We miss seeing each other. And it's not just work. It's all working together as a family to kind of come to the common goal of taking care of our patients, but also seeing each other's well-being. And here's a nice picture of the entire group at a dinner last year. Uh, and I'm really, really gonna miss all of you guys. I really appreciate everything Sinai has done for me. Um, Jay, thank you for again for those kind words that, uh, that you said at the beginning of this talk. And um, I'm truly gonna miss you guys. Thank you again for everything. Thanks so much, Paul. That was awesome. Um, I'm really going to miss having you as a roommate in our shared office. Likewise, Chris. Hey, Paul, this is Kurt. Um, just wanted to say thank you very much as a fellow resident. You know, you brought a really, really different and interesting uh, aspect to uh, your cases. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of times we're taught one way, um, the Sinai way. And you, since you were trained elsewhere, you were able to bring a really interesting different perspective to the endovascular training so i really wanted to say i appreciate that and i really appreciate your dedication to education especially as a fellow uh, learning a lot of anatomy and you taking time to really go through everything and teach us so really appreciate it it was a pleasure kurt thank you paul this is travis i just want to echo what uh, kurt said i'm very grateful for uh you mentoring me during my early stage of my uh, forward fellowship and taking me through cases and teaching me so much um Sinai is, is less for having you go, but I'm, I'm sure they're your the opportunity. They're going to be very grateful uh, to have you there. And I really uh, wish you the best of, of luck in uh, going out there. That's Paul. Thank you, Travis. I wish you the best as well. And please keep in touch. There's my contact info at the bottom if there's anything I can do for you. Dr. Singh, we spent a lot of time uh, in during COVID times in the neuro ICU together. And I'll never forget those uh, that time that you were teaching us neurocritical care, and we were managing neuro patients as well as um, you know other uh, boarders that came through, um, and appreciated every moment of it. But also as a vascular attending, uh, as I was coming up as a junior resident, all your teaching um, throughout the years. <laughs> we'll miss you. Thank you, Alejandro. Hey, Paul Coast is here. Great, great presentation and really great working with you. You've done, you know, some tumor cases with us and uh, really wish you the best. And we're definitely going to miss you. Same here, Coast. I'm really going to miss working with you. It was really a nice experience with you. Okay, thanks, everybody. That concludes Grand Rounds for today. Have a great day.